What's up everyone, Thralls of Metal back again bringing you yet another discography ranking. I am Shredlord. Nick. Jam and John. Today we are very excited to bring you Opeth. Now as you know we kind of all go around and give each other a band to pick and this was my pick so I decided Opeth. Uh, Opeth being one of my favorite bands of all time, uh, these guys are also huge fans so we figured this would be an absolute fun one to do. Difficult. Too many very good albums. I hate, <laughs> very difficult. I hate big discographies. Not because I hate big discographies. It's the, the band, choices you have to but make. But like, oh. to to rank thirteen albums, especially when you're a big fan of something, is really fucking difficult. And I, I don't I, like it. And for that reason, I feel like I'll put out the disclaimer for all of us. Uh, well, especially myself speaking. I don't dislike any of these albums. It's no, just no. unfortunately in a ranking, I had to rank them. And so, you know, even if something's lower on the list or mid-range in the list, it's not like, oh my god, he doesn't like it. No, that's absolutely not the case. It's just there can only be one, 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 two, so on, so And a last place. And a last place. <laughs> and a last place. Okay. If you're not first, you're last. Right, so tell that to the other 12. Mm -hmm. But I digress. All right. So, let's go ahead and give you a little bit of background on Opeth. Opeth was originally formed by a guy named David Isberg, Eisberg, something like that, in Stockholm, Sweden in 1989. He was a lead vocalist. Uh, he had assembled this band. The inspiration was actually from a Wilbur Smith novel called The Sunbird. Uh, there was a city called Opet, which translates in African, I believe, Wikipedia said what? City of the Moon? So that's kind of where the name derived. This David gentleman was the lead vocalist, like I said, and he decided that he wanted to bring his ex-bandmate, Michael Ockerfeldt, from his old band Eruption into the fold and have him play bass. Well, when that happened, the rest of the bandmates had a shit storm and all walked out. So left is just basically David, and Michael to kind of carry on this new band, what would be Opeth. After about four or five years of really low progression, lineup changes, not much going on. Basically, five years is a long time not to do anything as a band. So, Eisberg said, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, if not, I apologize. He said, peace, I'm out, and that left Michael on his own. So, Michael recruited some gentlemen, and finally, Opeth was going to have a debut release in 1994 called Orchid. Orchid is an interesting album. There's definitely more black metal influence to this, it. Yes. And this really has just kind of a creepy atmosphere for it. Um, the production is notably a little bit more raw. I believe the production was Dan, Dan Swano, Swano, which Dan Swano is... Everybody should know who Dan yeah. Swano is. He produces a thousand metal albums. Bloodbath, Edge of Sanity. And, I mean, I had this one a little bit low. This is number 12. Not quite last place. Oh. I don't think it's bad, necessarily. And this one, again, this is the uh, difficulty of this band. It's just the songs are long, and I think they're long for the sake of being long. I, yes. Yes. Yeah. I think I think they were also kind of pushing the lengths, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. they were. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I love long songs. And oh, yeah. I love them. But if you're doing them just to do them, like... The progressions weren't quite there yet. Like, the big dynamic moments. Yeah. Under the Weeping Moon, great song. I think that's probably the biggest standout sure, on here. Sure, sure. I'll put this at number nine for me personally. There's two instrumentals on the album, and they're both really short. But the other songs are easily ten minutes plus, except for one which clocks in, I think, at like 9.55, boo-hoo, five seconds. But <laughs> every other song is ten minutes. I think uh, they were kind of experimenting with what works, what doesn't work, and you could tell that they were really starting to put together this unique puzzle that would eventually become the powerhouse of Opeth. So, yeah, much more black metal and much more death metal. And there's there's definitely little prog moments in here, but it's, it's more raw and... I think they were trying to cater more to what was going on at the time. Yeah, I mean, they just started with Peaceville. And yeah, Peaceville yeah. definitely had a back catalog of bands that uh, they probably needed to fit in with a little bit to get on the label. This is my number 10. Again, like you said earlier, there's not a bad, you know, it's not that I, I don't like this album, because it, it's it's good. But to me, it doesn't showcase what Opeth is. And because. Like, it, like, it's a good start. Everybody's got to start somewhere, but... You could tell it was a, a, a first start. Move forward to 1996, only a year later, Opeth decides to continue on and create the album Morning Rise, and this would be the last one produced with Dan Swano. To me, it was the logical next step after Orchid. You can start telling there's a little bit more experimentation mm -hmm. in the songwriting. Mm -hmm. I personally put this album at number eight, 
Songs like Black Rose Immortal and To Bid You Farewell are amazing. Black Rose Immortal is like a 20 minute track, so that kind of... Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the longest track they ever did, I think. Pro I, that's probably I think correct. so too, yeah. I don't think there's anything longer than that. I think 20, 20 minutes is 20 minutes is pretty fucking long. So. <laughs> yeah, not many bands dabble with that, right? Mm, a I mean, handful. Dream Theater does. Dream Theater, Meshuga. has yeah. done a 20 minute track before. Uh, I had this one at number 10. I think this was definitely an improvement. I think the songs were more dynamic and more memorable. Again, they were a little long and they didn't have enough dynamics within like a 20 minute song to really keep it interesting all the way but there was notable improvement i like the production better mm -hmm. i think it sounded a lot more full and there's really killer bass work on this album like there's a lot of these cool little bass flourishes that were really excellent i don't remember the name of the bassist on that album uh, but it is anders norden and johan de farfala that's yeah. the bassist and the drummer this huh? would actually be their last album with opeth as well before uh we get a taste of the Martins, but we'll get into that uh, <laughs> in next. This is my number 11. Really, it was a, a, a crisscross between this <laughs> and Orchid. Like, I just couldn't figure out what order to put them in. I mean, obviously, this record does get a little better, uh, especially production-wise. It sounds like a natural progression towards what they were looking for sound-wise to continue forward, but put a little bit more polish on it, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Badass songs, it just fell low on the list. All right. Well, moving on to 1998, like I said, the bassist and the drummer have decided to uh, take off, leaving just Ockerfelt and Peter Lindgren on guitar. However, they are able to pull in what I refer to as the Martins, Martin Mendez and Martin Lopez, both incredible musicians mm -hmm. in their own right, yes. uh, an amazing drummer, an amazing bass player. To me, this was, as much as I like Frederick and Martin Axenrod, like these, this is like, this is quite a lineup to behold mm -hmm. right here with Mike and Peter Lindgren and Mendez and Lopez. They put out my favorite album by them. This is number one on my list, hands down. My Arms, Your Hearse. A little side note about the album. Unfortunately, they did recruit Mendez, but he did not end up being able to, because of time restraints, playing bass on the album. Also, this is something that Mike said. This is the very first time he had ever written all the lyrics before the album because he had a theme and a concept in mind so mm. technically this would be considered Opeth's yep. their first, first concept album, album. Yeah, so first, yep. yeah every, everything about this album flowed for me all the songs sounded like they were cut from the same cloth but they were all different still mm -hmm. um this has a dark beautiful vibe that to this day is like the perfect album to me and yeah i can't say enough good things about <laughs> it i'll just jerk it off all day so i'm gonna let <laughs> This was my number four. I love this album. This was the big turning point for Opeth. Like this became something bigger than what they were. Like the proggy elements started coming in. Demon of the Fall I, yeah, and When one. have to be two of my favorite songs on there. Demon of the Fall is one of my absolute favorites. The second time I got to see Opeth, they played that one in their set. Because the first time I saw them, they weren't playing any of the growling vocals. It was a little upset. They didn't they play it when you and I saw them with Mastodon? Jam and John and I actually, we went and saw Mastodon, Ghost, and Opeth, mm -hmm. and they absolutely encored with Demon of the Fall, and he absolutely growled. Yes. And I yes. absolutely got hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, But yeah, man. that was, it was, it was amazing. It was downright amazing. This is my number six. I mean, Demon of the Fall, what, what can I say? What, what more do you want me to say about this album? Obviously, the mix got a lot better, and yeah, it had kind of an... Uh, when you said, um, you know, how they were all kind of cut from the same cloth, it all sounds like it flows really well on this album. Like, this album was meant to have this tone carried across it. And I dig it. It's just number six. So in 1999, Opeth releases Still Life. In walks Frederick Nordstrom, the producer, who is a very famous metal producer. He's the producer for Slaughter of the Soul by At The Gates, Arch Enemy, I wrote down a bunch of them, Dark Tranquility, and Flames, Soil Work, so on and so forth. Also, the Gothenburg sound. Yeah, right, right, right. absolutely. <laughs> Swedish sound. Yeah, yep, he's, yep. he's the king of the Swedish sound, man. So, uh, And actually, Necrotic brought up the fact that they were on Peaceville Records. This was the first album that was released on Peaceville Records, and it was also finally the first album to feature Martin Mendez on the bass. Yep. I gave this a seven. I really enjoyed the brutal heaviness, and there's some beautifully epic moments like in Godhead's Lament and The More. This album is incredibly well written, and 
it was a little bit more the contrasts were a little bit more harsher than the mm -hmm. previous album but i dug it still and it was still really good to me so i gave it seven i had this at number three uh this one really kind of just stuck up i mean i didn't listen to this album forever and yeah, again i already knew i loved godhead's lament the more white cluster is such a beautiful closer to the album I thought the songs became more lush. I think there was more layering with the keys and the change of production, I think also added something to it that had a more full sound. I just, I love the songwriting on this. I think this is really them just continuously building from My Arms, Your Hers. I had this at number seven as well. I think to elaborate on what you were saying, I think this is when Opeth started to hone into the fact that they were a progressive band as well. Like the songwriting, alluded to wanting to venture further into the realm of, of what they could do as musicians. They didn't so, just want to be lumped into the whole scene. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Especially since this is their fourth album, you know, by this point in, in a career is kind of when you, you want to start making waves if you plan on continuing. So that's it, kind it of was a good it, wave. Yeah, it was, it was a, a good wave. wave. And, and, and again, I like the production change too, getting that Swedish tone on there. Yeah. It just, it, it really paved the way for what came next. Two years go by to 2001 and we get Blackwater Park. While Mr. Nordstrom stays on as engineer, Michael Ockerfeldt develops a friendship with a little British gentleman named Stephen Wilson, who is the singer, songwriter, guitar player. Um, Master of, mastermind. Master Yeah, I love Stephen Wilson. Behind Porcupine <laughs> Tree. And yeah, yeah Porcupine yeah. Tree is a big favorite of mine too. So these guys developed this friendship and through that friendship, I guess there was a conversation had between them where, you know, Mike threw the idea of having Steven produce the album and he sent him some demos of what Blackwater Park was going to be and then he goes, yeah, okay, I'll do it, sure. This is my number three Opeth album. Songs like Bleak, Bleak. Uh, The Drapery Falls are masterpieces, man. There's some, there's some Opeth masterpieces on mm -hmm. this album. Yes. Steven Wilson's production and his ability to mm -hmm. draw out a lot of creativeness from Michael Ockerfeldt really shown through. And, and emotion too. There's yeah. a lot of emotion on this album. Yeah. And um, lush. Yeah. This was uh, an amazing album to listen to growing up. And this, you know, this has a lot of uh, nostalgic value for me as well. This is my number two. So this was the first Opeth album I actually ever heard. I was at my buddy Rob Cornell's house on 4th of July, burning down his garage with fireworks, and he was jamming Blackwater Park and. Uh, I mean, bleak. That's yeah. all I've got to say. That's yeah, such a rough. beautiful fucking song. And it's really difficult to even pick favorites out of this record without just reciting the entire fucking track listing. Harvest. Yeah, yeah dude, just, Harvest. I mean, just, yeah, there's so many. I, I, you know, so many I, I still do this. Jay jam this record all the time. Uh, in fact, when I show people now metal, that don't like metal, I often use Bleak as a song just because it's so fucking pretty. It is. I have this at number five. This is not my first Opeth album, that one comes a little bit later, but this one was a star change, namely the production. The production on this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is lush, it's full, it's beautifully layered. I think uh, Michael's Cleans got even better on this. Oh, yeah. Bleak is one of my favorite Opeth songs all time. Ever, yeah. But I, it sucks that I had to bring it down to five, but there's other albums I just got into a bit more. But Blackwater Park is a fucking benchmark album for him. Incredible stuff. So, being the busy bees that Opeth are, a year later they decide, well, they decided that they wanted to put out a double album and have one out of like the first half be super heavy and then another album have that second half be like really mellow and proggy. However, they in the end decided against it and decided to just release two albums within like a six Here. to eight month span, something yeah. really short. The first of that being Deliverance. Deliverance, my number four Opeth album, is one of the most balls to the wall, heaviest Opeth albums, um, aggressive as fuck, crunchy as fuck. Everything about this album is just raw aggression. But what's kind of cool about this is I believe this album won them best rock performance in Ooh. Sweden. They won their first Grammys or Grammys or something like that. It's like Grammy, but different. <laughs> um, Steven Wilson also ended up producing this album, which maybe 
I don't know. Maybe he can do super heavy. Maybe he should do more heavy production. Because that one didn't really stick with me until I just said it out loud in front of the camera. Like, right. yeah, Stephen Wilson did produce that album. Like, man, you know, not that he can't get heavy guitar tones and things like that, but it's just like, it was just brutal. It was fucking awesome. I love yeah. it. Four, I mean, number four all day. Yep. Number two here. This was my first Opeth album. I remember seeing ads for it in various metal mags and the hype around it. Like they had quotes like, man, greatest metal achievement, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. <laughs> then I picked it up and I was like, fuck. Like right from the start, Wreath is mm -hmm. disgusting. But then you get to the title track. Dude. And the title track is quite possibly my favorite <laughs> Opeth song. <laughs> So fucking heavy, and that last the, fucking dude, part. Dude, like the end, the end, like two and a half, three minutes of that oh. song are just fucking sick. And we saw it live again when we saw Opeth this past, well, when shows still played. Yeah. And they, last two, they, the last two times I've seen Opeth, that was their encore. A 13 minute encore of just blazing riffs. Ugh. Yep. So good. Yep. This is my number five. There are things that definitely, you know, went above it, but this is a solid fucking album, and I I agree, uh, the song Deliverance, I mean, I jammed that song over and over and over again, and then when I learned how to play the end part on the drums, that was kind of cool, <laughs> but yeah, I dig that album a whole bunch, again, it's, you know, Opeth is really shining by this point in albums as well, so, yeah, good stuff. And then part two, Damnation the next Opeth album. Now this is the the other album that was supposed to be soft and boy golly was it. However, to me this album still had a very dark haunting mm -hmm. feel to it and I think through the clarity of the instrumentation you really get to hear not only all the individual instrumentalists shine mm -hmm. for being incredible musicians, but I think Mike Ockerfeld went really above and beyond his songwriting and really came up with some incredible, mm -hmm. incredible songwriting and really focused on the structure. I put this at number five. No real metal, so to speak. I was okay with that. Part of the reason I did love Opeth was because of this vibe in their music. Mm -hmm. So hearing it, but still having that like, it wasn't cheesy, it was still really dark, really haunting, really melancholy, and I dug it, so. I like the atmosphere on it. I had this at number eight. Most of the time when I was listening to it, I was just kind of waiting for that big heavy moment, knowing full well it wasn't going to come because I knew what this album was going to be about. But the music is really good on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Death Whisper to Lullaby. Closure is probably my favorite song on here. That one's always one I've returned to. But again, like I said, I kept waiting for this big giant tension release and a big heavy moment that I knew full well wasn't coming. And that kind of took a little bit off for me. Still love the music and once again showcase the diversity in terms of writing that they have in the band. This is my number four. I really dig this album. I've always dug this album, albeit it's it's quieter. It's still got a bunch of groove in it. The musicianship is tits. I really like certain mixing, uh, like the mixing of the drums. The drums on this record sound amazing. And Hope Leaves is such a pretty song. Yeah. Shred and I were in a band together. We covered Death Whisper to Lullaby and that went really well. I love to put on this album when I'm looking to relax. When I have people over that don't necessarily even listen to metal, I'll throw on this record because it's such a... Oh, what's that? It sounds so nice. Is it that Dan Fogelberg? <laughs> you kids in your Trojan horse. <laughs> <laughs> you kids in your, in your Pac-Man video games and your Dan, Dan Fogelberg, Fogelberg records. records. Moving on two years later to 2005 comes the release of Ghost Reveries. Jens Bagren comes in to produce the album. Also, this is the very first album of Opeth where Per Weiberg, the keyboard player that they had been using on the previous tour, had become an official member. Also, this is the first album since Still Life to where all the music was actually written beforehand going into the studio. A lot of times they would go into the studio with ideas and skeletons and hammer them out and connect them, but this time everything was kind of prepared and ready to go in by the time they got there. So I have this as my number six album. The songs that are great on this album are incredibly, incredibly great. The Harlequin Forest, Ghost of Perdition, Grand um, The Grand, Grand Conjuration. Conjuration. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Excellent <laughs> songs. Still, six, just because there were still some songs in the middle that while I enjoyed them, it didn't have the strongest feel all throughout, but still the songs that I love on this album are just big old, big old titties. So, 
This was my number three. I mean, I can't really call out too much on the songs since they've all been taken, but it, again, Grand Conjuration. Oh. Um, I really like the, the mix of this album too. You know, again, I'm a fan of longer songs and metal when they're done correctly. And this record certainly does that. And it's got a lot of jamming moments. I, you know, it's great to drive down the expressway too, jamming the Grand Conjuration. Love that song. But yeah, I mean, it's a fucking kick-ass record. And I think it also culminates a bit of um, the sound of Deliverance and Damnation together as far as when the cleans do appear. And yeah. when they calm it down a little bit, it, it seems to be right in the, the vein of those two. And I really dig those records too. So I also have this one at number six. I really loved the production on here. I think Jens did a great job. He kind of took a little bit of what Stephen Wilson was doing in terms of the layering and making it sound more organic, but also brought back some heft to it. Like the guitar sounded really full. Bang and the Hounds, no one mentioned that one. That's another fucking killer track on here. But yeah, that was the mm -hmm. only issue I really had were like the great songs were insanely good mm -hmm. and then the other songs were kind of just there like Hollywood Horse is all right I don't think I it's nearly as good as like Bang in the House, Grand Conjuration etc but there's a lot of other uh, songs in there that just kind of yeah, they're there they're good but they're not you know that great level still an awesome album I actually have a special edition of this that has Soldier of Fortune on it done by Deep Purple too and it was worth buying twice so yeah Jump to 2008 and we're almost to the end of an era for Opeth. Peter Lindgren and Martin Lopez decide to leave for different pastures. In walks Frederick Ockeson and Martin Axenrod on guitar and drums to kind of fill in the void and release the album Watershed. This is my number two album. This is going to be the last Opeth album with a very heavy uh, metal presence and we haven't heard growls. Mike Ockerfeld's vocal cords have been missing since this album, since 2008. Sigh. It's been 12 years now, so if someone or anyone you know has any information leading to the finding and or arrest of the thief who took Michael Ockerfeld's vocal cords, please call us or yes, let us know please. on our channel. God. Please. Bogren once again produces this album. One thing that was really cool was the opening track that Love actually uh, had a female vocalist yep. interacting with Michael. That dude can croon. It's such a beautiful song. Huh? Yeah, he's a crooner. Yeah. He is a fucking crooner. Yep. He can croon the panties off of any metal chick and possibly one metal dude that I know. He doesn't wear panties. I don't wear panties. <laughs> 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 oh, but the songs were just. When they got heavy, they got like extremely heavy oh. and well written. Great epic moments too. Uh, even when you slow it down to a track like a burden, man, mm. and the leads trade oh, off yeah, the, the guitar harmonies and stuff, and and the um, the vocal melodies. Oh my god! Yeah, the vocal melodies and the song arrangements of that um, are amazing. But then you go to like Lotus Eater, and it's just heavy as balls. Oh, and the air apparent. Yeah, the, the air apparent. apparent like and Hex Omega. Oh, yeah. Hex Omega. Is this so good. this was Opeth doing what Opeth does best, which is giving you the best worlds of heavy metal epicness and just creative. Prog epicness. Yep. It, it, yep. This is number two for a reason. I, I think this is a great album. Number one. Mm -hmm. I absolutely adore this album. I love the balance. You get some of the heaviest stuff, like with um, Air Apparent. Yep. And then, you know, Burden, the opener, and even Hex Omega, which is all clean vocals too. These giant, gorgeous, lush, mm -hmm. like kind of prog epics. The writing on here is fantastic. The transitions, I don't think, ever got any smoother in terms of their metal years. No. It's it's a gorgeous album from start to finish. It's been my favorite pretty much since I heard it. It was like, yeah, nothing's gonna fucking beat Deliverance. And then Watershed came along. Like, yeah, dude. This is so good. Yeah. <laughs> this is also my number one. To me, this is the epitome of what Opeth is or was in this case. Again, Coil is such a beautiful fucking yeah. song. Yeah. I like listening to that when I'm driving home late at night sometimes. If somebody says, what's a good heavy Opeth song? I throw in Hex Omega because that song kicks ass. The, That's the they, appeal. They, to me, it sounds like a bunch of musicians all at the top of their game when it came to writing a, a, a quality record. And especially the 19 years into your career, you write a fucking masterpiece. I mean, that's... It doesn't get any better than that for me personally. So the well certainly wasn't dry. When he gets out of here, when he leaves us behind, <laughs> you'll find that he'll have that song as he's passing us by. Ooh. But I digress. Ooh, nice tie-in. <laughs> well done. Thank you. <laughs> 
Three years later, in 2011, Mike Ockerfeld makes a very big decision for Opeth. First of all, this is the first album, I believe, where he produced it all on his own. And he decides that the new way he wants to push Opeth is into a more of a progressive rock kind of band. And while he still maintained very similar songwriting structures, to a point, to a point. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he gave himself a little more freedom as far as like quirky riffs and things like that go and kind of, you know, more upbeat stuff, I guess. But the production, the tones and everything were really brought back, not to like a prog metal thing, but to like a prog like 70s rock thing. Yeah. Uh, and that King is Crimson, the, yeah, yes. yeah, that's the release yeah, yeah. of Heritage. This is my number 12. There was a lot of vintage tones on this album, be it the keyboards, be it the guitars. It's an album that was met with mixed reviews from all kinds of diehard Opeth fans because you have to think just three years earlier they released what many would argue hmm. is one of their best albums they've ever put out. I would. Um, yes, I would. And, <laughs> then, and then, and then they, they released something like this. Um, songs like Slither, The Devil's Orchard and stuff. While they are good songs, I remember listening to this album as a fan and going, Man, I wish this was just more of a Mike Ockerfeld solo album than it was in right, Opeth. Yeah. Right, right, right. But then I had to remind myself that really Opeth is Michael's band. Yep. So he's going to he's gonna let Opeth go in whatever direction he's feeling. And while uh, I didn't agree with the direction and really care for it, I didn't also hate this album. It's just one that I don't find myself listening to much at all. So that number 12 on my list. I had it at number 11, uh, not much higher. And pretty much the same thing. Uh, it just doesn't really jump out, and coming off of fucking Watershed, yeah, which was dude, amazing. How do you how do you follow that with this? Uh, albums like, like this are divisive when you try to change around the band's core sound, which it's still kind of there, but uh, much much softer. And the very analog production versus you know Jens Bogren's massive sure, production, sure, all of it changed. Like it it really even kind of lost the dark tone. You hear little bits of it, like in I Feel the Dark, which I think is a really good track, but it's definitely missing something, and it misses the meat on the guitars. Oh my God. But yeah, it's it's not terrible. It's just, I didn't, I can't, I just, it's hard to listen to. Right, it's <laughs> not what you expected from Opeth. No. So I had this at number nine. Would this come out? 2011. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like right before music became really accessible in all markets and before YouTube really kicked off. And so I, I didn't know exactly what I was going to get into with this record because it, if memory serves, it wasn't promoted the greatest either. I remember seeing I, the ads. They were still on Roadrunner. I think this record kind of well. snuck out actually. And I thought, well, shit, how are you going to follow up Watershed? Because you know, if they would have continued in that vein, it would have been fucking magical. So Heritage comes out, and initially when I heard it, I tried to look at it as, well, they put out an album like Damnation, so maybe this is, you know, them, as he, they like to, you know, release a bunch of heavy albums and then a soft one and then heavy albums. I thought, okay, maybe this is like the soft album, and it wasn't bad. Uh, Devil's Orchard, um, Hacksaw Process, I think that's how you say it. Yeah. Yeah, that song was decent, but it didn't really stand out. I, I jammed it a bunch and tried to get into it and never really just got into it the same Three years go by again, and we are given another Opeth album. Per Weiberg leaves Opeth, and in on keys is Joachim Svalberg. Svalberg? I don't know how to pronounce his name. He's real uh, good live. He's yeah, great he's a yeah. uh, great singer. He's yeah. actually yeah. Uh, an ex keyboard player of Ingve Malmsteen. Hmm. So, you know, he knows how to shred, he knows how to play his instrument. Makes sense then. Yeah, yeah, and he does really well with Opeth. He does a, a damn good job. Oh, yeah. This album was number 13. This was dead last, and I'll just kind of ruin the surprise here right now. And say that this is everyone's least favorite Opeth album. It's also my yeah, 13. Um, oh. uh, uh, mm. I was already um, not thrilled about Heritage and then when Pale Communion came out, once again it's not like I dislike it and I'm like this is shit. It just doesn't grab me as much as the other albums and really not much at all. Except for one song. Voice of Treason. I, I love the fuck out of that song. The, the, the drum beat on that song is nasty. Yeah. And when I heard him do Cusp of Eternity live, it sounded good, but they were also playing with a heavier guitar tone because they were playing heavier music that night. Right. Yep. And yep. It, it really just kind of filled out the sound. This album is just 
thin and kind of listless. It seems uninspired. It really does. Like, you know, especially coming off, because I'm going to call Heritage experimental at this point. Especially yeah, for I mean, yeah, it was sound. a gamble. Like, especially coming off of a gamble um, with Heritage, why you would delve even further into that sound without... I mean, you've got, you know, years of heavy music for your fans, and you can't just cut everybody the fuck off. Apparently and I then, can. I mean, he can, but <laughs> like that made it go way down in the list because of its similarity as far as feeling like that Heritage had. Like, all right, we've already had this once. Why do we get this again? I think they were telling people that we're all in on the new sound. Yes, it was definitely diving way harder into the the more rock, you know, the softer rock kind of st sound. While they always used modal progressions and things like that in their music to create good texture, uh, I really feel like on this album they kind of went with jazzier, um, even more so than normal, like jazzier and fusion yes. kind of chord structures, things like that. Um, and while I appreciate that kind of music, I'll just say that out of all the Opeth albums, this one is easily the least memorable for me. Yep. It's, it's very vocally driven, like generally the, you know, the music really drives it and then the vocals are secondary, an awesome layer put on top. Now, a lot of this has a lot of vocal harmonies all over the place, and with those really thin guitars, it, I don't know, it just doesn't really fill out the sound. And, I mean, you know, I appreciate him for sticking to his guns. And he wanted to do this thing and he did it. It's just, I think it could have been approached a little bit differently. But that's just me. It is what it is. Yep. All we can do is tell you how we feel, man. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Two years passed now, up to 2016. Hey, we're getting closer. And out comes the release of Sorceress. Now, I am the proud owner of that. A good friend... Uh, mm. A good friend <laughs> was kind enough when I was uh, laid up after a car injury to bring me back the copy of... The, I don't want to tell you who it is. I don't want to name drop like that. <laughs> um, uh, but it has all five Opeth members' uh, signatures on it. It's a double vinyl, and it came with a guitar pick, so it is badass. And I will say that while Sorceress is lower on the list on the whole, it's my number 11. When I heard this album, because I'm gonna listen to anything Opeth puts out, I'm, I'm just going to. Yeah. Uh, this was, so if I felt like these albums were here, it was coming back up, yes. slowly. It was coming back up slowly. I heard more of the darker themes. I heard a little bit more aggression. I know Michael went through a divorce during this album, so I'm sure, you know, moods and things like that right. played a part into it. But while Sorceress still wasn't the album that I wanted it to be, it was more so going back. The needle was pushing back towards what I thought to be metal. So yeah, I enjoy um, the album art. The themes for this, as far as like all the artwork goes and the music videos and stuff like this, I thought were really, really, yes. really cool. I had this at number nine. I I like the fact that it got a little bit heavier. Like it wasn't like the biggest guitar tone, but there was a little bit of chunk to it again. And you still start with the analog production, but I think the way you approached it with a heavier tone really filled out the sound. And I mean, I don't return to this album very often. I'll admit that. Mostly for the title track because it's a fucking banger. It's a flat out rocker. It's catchy as hell. Yes. Will the Wisp I think is really good too, but I like the fact that it didn't feel like they were trying to appease the fans, like we want to have you back, growl again. They wanted to do something maybe slightly heavier but still incorporate that new sound. I had this at number 12. For me personally, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, for me personally, everything after Watershed just kind of melts together. Um, it, it, it's not, you know, what I want out of an Opeth record, and again, you know, Sorceress, at least with the first track, the banger of the first track, it, I mean, it kind of sets the pace for the record. At least there's a little bit more going on here. It's not as thin on the production, which is good. But to me, it's still missing the sound of Opeth. Like, I listened through the whole thing, and I was just like, yeah, we're closer, but fuck, man. And finally, last year in 2019, we were blessed with yet another Opeth album, Encada Venom. Did I say that right? You yeah. Did. Hey. hey. <laughs> Uh, what was cool about this album is it was a double album. The first album was Swedish. The second album was English uh, lyrics. Uh, when you listen to both, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, just because of the way you have to say words, I'm sure, and like your syllables yep. and things like that. But and rhyming, um, it's really interesting. Yeah, it was very, very cool. To me, this is the best album of the post-Watershed era uh, because, yeah. once again, 
it, it keeps inching like yep. you know it's like the little engine that could for major pain he's got his nubs all kicking like this and he's coming back to the metals and he's, yeah so uh interesting Lee, comparison yeah yeah really sorry <laughs> Lee, Lee well done though yeah thank you yeah yeah, yeah. thank you very yeah. animated yeah lead work was incredible yes. um there were some really powerful awesome hooks that uh i hadn't really gotten in past opeth albums of recent and thought that this was uh even though it wasn't the heavy masterpiece that we all pray for every time opeth comes out with an album it was incredibly well produced the guitars kept getting a little bit heavier a little mm -hmm. bit heavier mm -hmm. a little bit of chug a little bit of chug good transitions and good songwriting i really enjoyed this album it was one of uh, my favorites of last year yeah I have this at number seven. I think this is the best album they've done in the Prog years. I agree with him on that. I love the songwriting. I think the songwriting is varied. Uh, each track really stands out on its own. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of stuff that really repeats. And there's a theme to it. There's like a Swedish film that the excerpts are kind of spliced throughout the album, which mm -hmm. really gives it like an interesting tone and mood to it. And I have to say, All Things Shall Pass, the last track is probably my favorite track on that entire album. We're talking like Pink Floyd levels of just beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they played it live last time. And it yeah, they right. crushed it. It was amazing. I have I actually have a video of that. I have a full video oh, of that was song. so good. This is my number eight. And again, I'll agree. Out of their post-Watershed years, this would be the best uh, out of the ones they released afterward. It gave me a little bit of hope for what might be coming in the future for Opeth. I mean, while the... Because uh, it was definitely heavier. It was definitely heavier than than what they'd had in the past, and the it, it it's like you said, it just kind of you're you're almost like you think like this is gonna be it, and that it's like that download. You're just waiting for it, you know. You're just waiting for it, like two percent at a time, man. Ninety nine percent for fucking forever. Man. <laughs> right, 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 right. This kind of at least gets back there, and I, again, you know, the the songs I even heard him play live for this record were, were tits and uh that was a good chunk of the set you know this too. is not a record i jam often but if i had to go through and, and pick post watershed years this would be one i'd pull out first so i was surprised at how much i actually came back to this album and it wasn't just because we were reviewing it i i legit wanted to keep listening to this yeah. because they had stepped up the game and they kind of changed just a little bit just enough and i think there was a little bit of intensity that was missing from the previous albums yeah. as part of their career it just it worked it was good yeah well there you have it ladies and gentlemen you kind of heard all of our opinions and where we put these albums i think it's a safe thing to say that we all really love opeth and while we generally agree on where we feel like the music kind of fell off uh, as far as from a metalhead's perspective yeah um, yeah you know, we made the disclaimer at the beginning of the video that Opeth are, are very precious to us. And so, in no way, shape, or form are we dogging the albums in the later years. No. Because I'm sure there's plenty of people that really like them and appreciate the songwriting sure. and appreciate sure. the vibe. Uh, and we definitely appreciate it, but it's just... When we think of Opeth, and I know most people will agree with us, we have this glorious vision in mind. And that's what we're all just patiently waiting for to come <laughs> back. I mean, we were... We were pretty much brought up in an era where they were just cranking out amazing albums. Yeah. It's been a weird adjustment. It's like it's like our parents broke up and we just haven't mm -hmm. like we haven't, haven't, haven't processed it. Yeah, yet. we haven't gotten used to the shared custody and you know, stay with mom or right, stay with right, dad. Which right. one of you is getting me a Nintendo? It, <laughs> and it's like we keep wanting dad to take us for the weekend, but he's you know, he'll take us for like a day. He teases us. Just like Michael teases us. You know. But but anyway, I'm stupid and I digress. But yeah. We hope that you enjoyed this video. We look forward to doing many more discography rankings. I believe what's the next one we're gonna do? Celtic Frost. Yeah. We haven't touched on black metal enough and I wanted to pick a really classic one. So Necrotic's gonna have us do Celtic Frost. Uh, by the way, Opeth did an incredible cover of that on My Arms, Your Hearse. Circle B -side. the Tyrants. So, just in case you didn't know that, you should check it out. It's fucking sweet. And it was a way to tie Opeth in. So, yeah, be on the lookout for that video. Once again, everyone, I know that shit sucks outside. However, stay inside, stay safe, stay home, all that jazz. Wash your hands. Wash your hands, wash your ass, your dirty, dirty ass. Still and get the potatoes out of your ears. Yeah, yeah. get the potatoes. That's good advice the least tasty potatoes on the planet i'm sure that's yeah. debatable but anyway 
God, no. If you like what you saw here, please hit the like and subscribe button. We appreciate all your guys' support and you taking the time to watch our video. So from everyone here at Thralls of Metal, we are signing out, but we will catch you on the next one. Peace. Take care.